section zero of germinal by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt berard section zero introduction by havelock ellis germinal was published in eighteen eighty five after occupying zola during the previous year in accordance with his usual custom but to a greater extent than with any other of his books except la debacle he accumulated material beforehand for six months he travelled about the coal-mining district in northern france and belgium especially the borinage around mom notebook in hand he was inquisitive was that gentleman miner told Sherard, who visited the neighborhood at a later period and found that the miners in every village knew german all that was a tribute of admiration the book deserved but it was never one of zola's most popular novels it was neither amusing enough nor outrageous enough to attract the multitude yet german all occupies a place among zola's works which is constantly becoming more assured so that to some critics it even begins to seem the only book of his that in the end may survive in his own time as we know the accredited critics of the day could find no condemnation severe enough for zola brunetier attacked him perpetually with a fury that seemed inexhaustible scherer could not even bear to hear his name mentioned anatole france though he lived to relent thought it would have been better if he had never been born even at that time however there were critics who inclined to view germinal more favorably thus faguet who was the recognized academic critic of the end of the last century while he held that posterity would be unable to understand how zola could ever have been popular yet recognized him as in germinal the heroic representative of democracy incomparable in his power of describing crowds and he realized how marvelous is the conclusion of this book to-day when critics view zola in the main with indifference rather than with horror although he still retains his popular favor the distinction of germinal is yet more clearly recognized Selier, while regarding the capitalistic conditions presented as now of an ancient and almost extinct type yet sees germinal standing out as the poem of social mysticism while andre guide a completely modern critic who has left a deep mark on the present generation observes somewhere that it may nowadays cause surprise that he should refer with admiration to germinal but it is a masterly book that fills him with astonishment he can hardly believe that it was written in french and still less that it should have been written in any other language it seems that it should have been created in some international tongue the high place thus claimed for germinal will hardly seem exaggerated the book was produced when zola had at length achieved the full mastery of his art and before his hand had as in his latest novels begun to lose its firm grasp the subject lent itself moreover to his special aptitude for presenting in vivid outline great human groups and to his special sympathy with the collective emotions and social aspirations of such groups we do not as so often in zola's work become painfully conscious that he is seeking to reproduce aspects of life with which he is imperfectly acquainted or fitting them into scientific formulas which he was imperfectly understood he shows a masterly grip of each separate group and each represents some essential element of the whole they are harmoniously balanced and their mutual action and reaction leads on inevitably to the splendid tragic dose with yet its great promise for the future i will not here discuss zola's literary art i have done so in my book of affirmations it is enough to say that 
though he was not a great master of style zola never again wrote so finely as here a word may be added to explain how this translation fell to the lot of one whose work has been in other fields in eighteen ninety three the late a texera de matos was arranging for private issue a series of complete versions of some of zola's cheap novels and offered to assign germanon to me my time was taken up with preliminary but as yet unfruitful preparation for what i regarded as my own special task in life and i felt that i must not neglect the opportunity of spending my spare time in making a modest addition to my income my wife readily fell into the project and agreed on the understanding that we shared the proceeds to act as my amanuensis so in the little cornish village over the sea we then occupied the evenings of the early months of eighteen ninety four were spent over germinal i translating aloud and she with swift efficient untiring pen following now and then bettering my english dialogue with her pungent wit in this way i was able to gain a more minute insight into the details of zola's work and a more impressive vision of the massive structure he here raised than can easily be acquired by the mere reader that joint task has remained an abidingly pleasant memory it is moreover a satisfaction to me to know that i have been responsible however inadequately for the only complete english version of this wonderful book a great fresco as zola himself called it a great prose epic as it has seemed to some worthy to compare with the great verse epics of old End of section zero section one of germano by emile zola this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org reading by matt perrard part one chapter one over the open plain beneath a starless sky as dark and thick as ink a man walked alone along the highway from marchaine to montel a straight paved road ten kilometres in length intersecting the beetroot fields he could not even see the black soil before him and only felt the immense flat horizon by the gusts of march wind squalls as strong as on the sea and frozen from sweeping leagues of marsh and naked earth no tree could be seen against the sky and the road unrolled as straight as a pier in the midst of the blinding spray of darkness the man had set out from marchand about two o'clock he walked with long strides shivering beneath his worn cotton jacket and corduroy breeches a small parcel tied in a check handkerchief troubled him much and he pressed it against his side sometimes with one elbow sometimes with the other so that he could slip to the bottom of his pockets both the benumbed hands that bled beneath the lashes of the wind a single idea occupied his head the empty head of a workman without work and without lodging the hope that the cold would be less keen after sunrise for an hour he went on thus when on the left two kilometers from Monceau, he saw red flames three fires burning in the open air and apparently suspended at first he hesitated half afraid then he could not resist the painful need to warm his hands for a moment the steep road led downwards and everything disappeared the man saw on his right a paling a wall of coarse planks shutting in a line of rails while a grassy slope rose on the left surmounted by confused gables a vision of a village with low uniform roofs he went on some two hundred paces suddenly at a bend in the road the fires reappeared close to him though he could not understand how they burnt so high in the dead sky like smoky moons but on the level soil another sight had struck him it was a heavy mass a low pile of buildings from which rose the silhouette of a factory chimney occasional gleams appeared from dirty windows 
five or six melancholy lanterns were hung outside to frames of blackened wood which vaguely outlined the profiles of gigantic stages and from this fantastic apparition drowned in night and smoke a single voice arose the thick long breathing of a steam escapement that could not be seen then the man recognized the pit his despair returned what was the good there would be no work instead of turning towards the buildings he decided at last to ascend the pit bank on which burnt in iron baskets the three coal fires which gave light and warmth for work the labourers in the cutting must have been working late they were still throwing out the useless rubbish now he heard the landers push the wagons on the stages he could distinguish living shadows tipping over the trams or tubs near each fire good day he said approaching one of the baskets turning his back to the fire the carman stood upright he was an old man dressed in knitted violet wool with a rabbit-skin cap on his head while his horse a great yellow horse waited with the immobility of stone while they emptied the six trains he drew the workman employed at the tipping cradle a red-haired lean fellow did not hurry himself he pressed on the lever with a sleepy hand and above the wind grew stronger an icy north wind and its great regular breaths passed by like the strokes of a scythe good day replied the old man there was silence the man who felt that he was being looked at suspiciously at once told his name i am called etienne lantier i am an engine man any work here the flames lit him up he might be about twenty-one years of age a very dark handsome man who looked strong in spite of his thin limbs the carman thus reassured shook his head work for an engine man no no there were two came yesterday there's nothing august cut short their speech then etienne asked pointing to the sombre pile of buildings at the foot of the platform a pit isn't it the old man this time could not reply he was strangled by a violent cough at last he expectorated and his expectoration left a black patch on the purple soil yes a pit the varou there the settlement is quite near in his turn and with extended arm he pointed out in the night the village of which the young man had vaguely seen the roofs but the six trams were empty and he followed them without cracking his whip his legs stiffened by rheumatism while the great yellow horse went on of itself pulling heavily between the rails beneath a new gust which bristled its coat the Vauroux was now emerging from the gloom etienne who forgot himself before the stove warming his poor bleeding hands looked round and could see each part of the pit the shed tarred with siftings the pit frame the vast chamber of the winding machine the square turret of the exhaustion pump this pit piled up in the bottom of a hollow with its squawk brick buildings raising its chimney like a threatening horn seemed to him to have the evil air of a gluttonous beast crouching there to devour the earth while examining it he thought of himself of his vagabond existence these eight days he had been seeking work he saw himself again at his workshop at the railway delivering a blow at his foreman driven from the mill driven from everywhere on saturday he had arrived at marchiennes where they said that work was to be had at the forges and there was nothing neither at the forges nor at sonneville's he had been obliged to pass the sunday hidden beneath the wood of a cartwright's yard from which the watchman had just turned him out at two o'clock in the morning he had nothing not a penny not even a crust what should he do wandering along the roads without aim not knowing where to shelter himself from the wind yes it was certainly a pit the occasional lanterns lighted up the square a door suddenly opened had enabled him to catch sight of the furnaces in a clear light he could explain even the escapement of the pump that thick long breathing that went on without ceasing 
and which seemed to be the monster's congested respiration the workman expanding his back at the tipping cradle had not even lifted his eyes on etienne and the latter was about to pick up his little bundle which had fallen to the earth when a spasm of coughing announced the carman's return slowly he emerged from the darkness followed by the yellow horse drawing six more laden trams are there factories at montsou asked the young man the old man expectorated then replied in the wind oh it isn't factories that are lacking should have seen it three or four years ago everything was roaring then there were not men enough there never were such wages and now they are tightening their bellies again nothing but misery in the country every one is being sent away workshops closing one after the other it is not the emperor's fault perhaps but why should he go and fight in america without counting that the beasts are dying from cholera like the people then in short sentences and with broken breath the two continued to complain etienne narrated his vain wanderings of the past week must one then die of hunger soon the roads would be full of beggars yes said the old man this will turn out badly for god does not allow so many christians to be thrown on the street we don't have meat every day but if one had bread true if one only had bread their voices were lost gusts of wind carrying away the words in a melancholy howl here began the carman again very loudly turning towards the south monceau was over there and stretching out his hand again he pointed out invisible spots in the darkness as he named them below at monceau the fauvelle sugar works were still going but the houghton sugar works had just been dismissing hands there were only the de Delo flour mill and the bleu rope walk for mine cables which kept up then with a large gesture he indicated the north half of the horizon the sonneville workshops had not received two-thirds of their usual orders only two of the three blast furnaces of the martian forges were alight finally at the gagebois glassworks a strike was threatening for there was talk of a reduction of wages i know i know replied the young man at each indication i have been there with us here things are going on at present added the carman but the pits have lowered their output and see opposite at the victoire there are also only two batteries of coke furnaces alight he expectorated and set out behind his sleepy horse after harnessing it to the empty trams now etienne could oversee the entire country the darkness remained profound but the old man's hand had as it were filled it with great miseries which the young man unconsciously felt at this moment around him everywhere in the limitless tract was it not a cry of famine that the march wind rolled up across this naked plain the squalls were furious they seemed to bring the death of labour a famine which would kill many men and with wandering eyes he tried to pierce shades tormented at once by the desire and by the fear of seeing everything was hidden in the unknown depths of the gloomy night he only perceived very far off the blast furnaces and the coke ovens the latter with their hundreds of chimneys planted obliquely made lines of red flame while the two towers more to the left burnt blue against the blank sky like giant torches it resembled a melancholy conflagration no other stars rose on the threatening horizon except these nocturnal fires in a land of coal and iron you belong to belgium perhaps began again the carman who had returned behind etienne this time he only brought three trams those at least could be tipped over an accident which had happened to the cage a broken screw-nut would stop work for a good quarter of an hour at the bottom of the pit bank there was silence the landers no longer shook the stages with a prolonged vibration one only heard from the pit the distant sound of a hammer tapping on an iron plate no i come from the south replied the young man the workman after having emptied the trams had seated himself on the earth glad of the accident 
maintaining his savage silence he had simply lifted his large dim eyes to the carman as if annoyed by so many words the latter indeed did not usually talk at such length the unknown man's face must have pleased him that he should have been taken by one of these itchings for confidence which sometimes make old people talk aloud even when alone i belong to Monceau, he said i am called bon mot is it a nickname asked etienne astonished the old man made a grimace of satisfaction and pointed to the Perot. yes yes they have pulled me three times out of that torn to pieces once with all my hair scorched once with my gizzard full of earth and another time with my belly swollen with water like a frog and then when they saw that nothing would kill me they called me bon mort for a joke his cheerfulness increased like the creaking of an ill-greased pulley and ended by degenerating into a terrible spasm of coughing the fire basket now clearly lit up his large head with its scanty white hair and flat livid face spotted with bluish patches he was short with an enormous neck projecting calves and heels and long arms with massive hands falling to his knees for the rest like his horse which stood immovable without suffering from the wind he seemed to be made of stone he had no appearance of feeling either the cold or the gusts that whistled at his ears when he coughed his throat was torn by a deep rasping he spat at the foot of the basket and the earth was blackened etienne looked at him and at the ground which he had thus stained have you been working long at the mine bonnemort flung open both arms long i should think so i was not eight when i went down into the voreau and i am now fifty-eight reckon that up i have been everything down there at first trammer then putter when i had the strength to wheel then pikeman for eighteen years then because of my cursed legs they put me into the earth cutting to bank up and patch until they had to bring me up because the doctor said i should stay there for good then after five years of that they made me carman eh that's fine fifty years of the mine forty-five down below while he was speaking fragments of burning coal which now and then fell from the basket lit up his pale face with their red reflection they tell me to rest he went on but i'm not going to i'm not such a fool i can get on for two years longer to my sixtieth so as to get the pension of one hundred and eighty francs if i wish them good evening to-day they would give me a hundred and fifty at once they are cunning the beggars besides i am sound except my legs you see it's the water which has got under my skin through being always wet in the cuttings there are days when i can't move a paw without screaming a spasm of coughing interrupted him again and that makes you cough so said etienne but he vigorously shook his head then when he could speak no no i caught cold a month ago i never used to cough now i can't get rid of it and the queer thing is that i spit that i spit the rasping was again heard in his throat followed by the black expectoration is it blood asked etienne at last venturing to question him bonnemort slowly wiped his mouth with the back of his hand it's coal i've got enough in my carcass to warm me till i die and it's five years since i put a foot down below i stored it up it seems without knowing it it keeps you alive there was silence the distant hammer struck regular blows in the pit and the wind passed by with its moan like a cry of hunger and weariness coming out of the depths of the night before the flames which grew low the old man went on in lower tones chewing over again his old recollections ah certainly it was not yesterday that he and his began hammering at the seam the family had worked for the monceau mining company since it started and that was long ago a hundred and six years already his grandfather guillaume Mahieu, an urchin of fifteen then had found the rich coal at Requilla, the company's first pit an old abandoned pit to-day down below near the fauvert sugar-works 
all the country knew it and as a proof the discovered scene was called the guillaume after his grandfather he had not known him a big fellow it was said very strong who died of old age at sixty then his father nicolas Mahou, called le roge when hardly forty years of age had died in the pit which was being excavated at that time a landslip a complete slide and the rock drank his blood and swallowed his bones two of his uncles and his three brothers later on also left their skins there he vincent Mayhew, who had come out almost whole except that his legs were rather shaky was looked upon as a knowing fellow but what could one do one must work one worked here from father to son as one would work at anything else his son toussaint Mayhew, was being worked to death there now and his grandsons and all his people who lived opposite in the settlement a hundred and six years of mining the youngsters after the old ones with the same master eh there were many bourgeois that could not give their history so well anyhow when one has got enough to eat murmured etienne again that is what i say as long as one has bread to eat one can live bonnemort was silent and his eyes turned towards the settlement where lights were appearing one by one four o'clock struck in the monceau tower and the cold became keener and is your company rich asked etienne the old man shrugged his shoulders and then let them fall as if overwhelmed beneath an avalanche of gold ah yes ah yes not perhaps so rich as its neighbour the anzin company but millions and millions all the same they can't count it nineteen pits thirteen at work the voreau the victoire Crecourt, miro st thomas madeleine foutre canal and still more and six were pumping or ventilation like Ricula, ten thousand workers concessions reaching over sixty-seven communes an output of five thousand tons a day a railway joining all the pits and workshops and factories ah yes ah yes there's money there the rolling of trams on the stages made the big yellow horse prick his ears the cage was evidently repaired below and the landers had got to work again while he was harnessing his beast to redescend, the carman added gently, addressing himself to the horse, "Won't do to chatter, lazy good for nothing. If Monsieur Hanbeau knew how you waste your time," Etienne looked thoughtfully into the night. He asked, "Then Monsieur Hanbeau owns the mine?" "No," explained the old man. "Monsieur Hanbeau is only the general manager. He is paid just the same as us." with a gesture the young man pointed into the darkness who does it all belong to them but bonnemort was for a moment so suffocated by a new and violent spasm that he could not get his breath then when he had expectorated and wiped the black froth from his lips he replied in the rising wind eh all that belong to nobody knows to people and with his hand he pointed in the darkness to a vague spot an unknown and remote place inhabited by those people for whom the maheus had been hammering at the seam for more than a century his voice assumed a tone of religious awe it was as if he were speaking of an inaccessible tabernacle containing a sated and crouching god to whom they had given all their flesh and whom they had never seen at all events if one can get enough bread to eat repeated etienne for the third time without any apparent transition indeed yes if we could always get bread it would be too good the horse had started the carman in his turn disappeared with the trailing step of an invalid near the tipping cradle the workman had not stirred gathered up in a ball burying his chin between his knees with his great dim eyes fixed on emptiness when he had picked up his bundle etienne still remained at the same spot he felt the gusts freezing his back while his chest was burning before the large fire perhaps all the same it would be as well to inquire at the pit the old man might not know then he resigned himself he would accept any work 
where should he go and what was to become of him in this country famished for lack of work must he leave his carcass behind a wall like a strayed dog but one doubt troubled him a fear of the barreau in the middle of this flat plain drowned in so thick a night at every gust the wind seemed to rise as if it blew from an ever-broadening horizon no dawn whitened the dead sky the blast furnaces alone flamed and the coke ovens making the darkness redder without illuminating the unknown and the voreux at the bottom of its hole with its posture as of an evil beast continued to crunch breathing with a heavier and slower aspiration troubled by its painful digestion of human flesh End of section one section two of germinal by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part one chapter two in the middle of the fields of wheat and beetroot the deux cent quarante settlement slept beneath the black night one could vaguely distinguish four immense blocks of small houses back to back barracks or hospital blocks geometric and parallel separated by three large avenues which were divided into gardens of equal size and over the desert plain one heard only the moan of squalls through the broken trellises of the enclosures in the mehu's house number sixteen in the second block nothing was stirring the single room that occupied the first floor was drowned in a thick darkness which seemed to overwhelm with its weight the sleep of the beings whom one felt to be there in a mass with open mouths overcome by weariness in spite of the keen cold outside there was a living heat in the heavy air that hot stuffiness of even the best kept bedrooms the smell of human cattle four o'clock had struck from the clock in the room on the ground floor but nothing yet stirred one heard the piping of slender respirations accompanied by two series of sonorous snores and suddenly catherine got up in her weariness she had as usual counted the four strokes through the floor without the strength to arouse herself completely then throwing her legs from under the bedclothes she felt about at last struck a match and lighted the candle but she remained seated her head so heavy that it fell back between her shoulders seeking to return to the bolster now the candle lighted up the room a square room with two windows and filled with three beds there could be seen a cupboard a table and two old walnut chairs whose smoky tone made hard dark patches against the walls which were painted a light yellow and nothing else only clothes hung to nails a jug placed on the floor and a red pan which served as a basin in the bed on the left zacharie the eldest a youth of one and twenty was asleep with his brother jeanlin who had completed his eleventh year in the right-hand bed two urchins lenore and henri the first six years old the second four slept in each other's arms while catherine shared the third bed with her sister Alzire, so small for her nine years that catherine would not have felt her near her if it were not for the little invalid's humpback which pressed into her side the glass door was open one could perceive this lobby of a landing a sort of recess in which the father and the mother occupied a fourth bed against which they had been obliged to install the cradle of the latest comer estelle aged scarcely three months however catherine made a desperate effort she stretched herself she fidgeted her two hands in the red hair which covered her forehead and neck slender for her fifteen years all that showed of her limbs outside the narrow sheath of her chemise were her bluish feet as it were tattooed with coal and her slight arms the milky whiteness of which contrasted with the sallow tint of her face already spoilt by constant washing with black soap a final yawn opened her rather large mouth with splendid teeth against the chlorotic power of her gums 
while her grey eyes were crying in her fight with sleep with a look of painful distress and weariness which seemed to spread over the whole of her naked body but a growl came from the landing and maheu's thick voice stammered devil take it it's time is it you lighting up catherine yes father it has just struck downstairs quick then lazy if you had danced less on sunday you would have woke up earlier a fine lazy life and he went on grumbling but sleep returned to him also his reproaches became confused and were extinguished in fresh snoring the young girl in her chemise with her naked feet on the floor moved about in the room as she passed by the bed of henri and lenore she replaced the coverlet which had slipped down they did not wake lost in the strong sleep of childhood alzire with open eyes had turned to take the warm place of her big sister without speaking i say now zacharie and you jeanlin i say now repeated catherine standing before her two brothers who were still wallowing with their noses in the bolster she had to seize the elder by the shoulder and shake him then while he was muttering abuse it came into her head to uncover them by snatching away the sheet that seemed funny to her and she began to laugh when she saw the two boys struggling with naked legs stupid leave me alone growled zacharie in ill temper sitting up i don't like tricks good lord say it's time to get up he was lean and ill-made with a long face and a chin which showed signs of a sprouting beard yellow hair and the anemic pallor which belonged to his whole family his shirt had rolled up to his belly and he lowered it not from modesty but because he was not warm it has struck downstairs repeated catherine come up father's angry jeanlin who had rolled himself up closed his eyes saying go and hang yourself i'm going to sleep she laughed again the laugh of a good-natured girl he was so small his limbs so thin with enormous joints enlarged by scrofula that she took him up in her arms but he kicked about his apish face pale and wrinkled with its green eyes and great ears grew pale with a rage of weakness he said nothing he bit her right breast beastly fellow she murmured keeping back a cry and putting him on the floor alzire was silent with the sheet tucked under her chin but she had not gone to sleep again with her intelligent invalid's eyes she followed her sister and her two brothers who were now dressing another quarrel broke out around the pan the boys hustled the young girl because she was so long washing herself shirts flew about and while still half asleep they eased themselves without shame with the tranquil satisfaction of a litter of puppies that had grown up together catherine was ready first she put on her miner's breeches then her canvas jacket and fastened the blue cap on her knotted hair in these clean monday clothes she had the appearance of a little man nothing remained to indicate her sex except the slight roll of her hips when the old man comes back said zacharie mischievously he'll like to find the bed unmade you know i shall tell him it's you the old man was the grandfather bonmort who as he worked during the night slept by day so that the bed was never cold there was always someone snoring there without replying catherine set herself to arrange the bedclothes and tuck them in but during the last moments sounds had been heard behind the wall in the next house these brick buildings economically put up by the company were so thin that the least breath could be heard through them the inmates lived there elbow to elbow from one end to the other and no fact of family life remained hidden even from the youngsters a heavy step had tramped up the staircase then there was a kind of soft fall followed by a sigh of satisfaction good said catherine levaque has gone down and here is Bobelot come to join the levaque woman jeanlin grinned even alzire's eyes shone every morning they made fun of the household of three next door a pikeman who lodged a worker in the cutting an arrangement which gave the woman two men one by night the other by day philomene is coughing began catherine again after listening she was speaking of the eldest levaque a big girl of nineteen 
and the mistress of zacharie by whom she had already had two children her chest was so delicate that she was only a sifter at the pit never having been able to work below pooh philomene replied zacharie she cares a lot she's asleep it's hoggish to sleep till six he was putting on his breeches when an idea occurred to him and he opened the window outside in the darkness the settlement was awaking lights were dawning one by one between the laths of the shutters and there was another dispute he leant out to watch if he could not see coming out of perron's opposite the captain of the voreux who was accused of sleeping with the perron woman while his sister called to him that since the day before the husband had taken day duty at the pit eye and that certainly dan sir could not have slept there that night while the air entered in icy whiffs both of them becoming angry maintained the truth of their own information until cries and tears broke out it was estelle in her cradle vexed by the cold maheu woke up suddenly what had he got in his bones then here he was going to sleep again like a good-for-nothing and he swore so vigorously that the children became still zacharie and jeanlin finished washing with slow weariness alzire with her large open eyes continually stared the two youngsters lenore and henri in each other's arms had not stirred breathing in the same quiet way in spite of the noise catherine give me the candle called out maheu she finished buttoning her jacket and carried the candle into the closet leaving her brothers to look for their clothes by what light came through the door her father jumped out of bed she did not stop but went downstairs in her coarse woolen stockings feeling her way and lighted another candle in the parlor to prepare the coffee all the savants of the family were beneath the sideboard will you be still vermin began maheu again exasperated by estelle's cries which still went on he was short like old bonmort and resembled him with his strong head his flat livid face beneath yellow hair cut very short the child screamed more than ever frightened by those great knotted arms which were held above her leave her alone you know that she won't be still said his wife stretching herself in the middle of the bed she also had just awakened and was complaining how disgusting it was never to be able to finish the night could they not go away quietly buried in the clothes she only showed her long face with large features of a heavy beauty already disfigured at thirty-nine by her life of wretchedness and the seven children she had borne with her eyes on the ceiling she spoke slowly while her man dressed himself they both ceased to hear the little one who was strangling herself with screaming eh you know i haven't a penny and this is only monday still six days before the fortnight's out this can't go on you all of you only bring in nine francs how do you expect me to go on we are ten in the house oh nine francs exclaimed maheu i and zacharie three that makes six catherine and the father two that makes four four and six ten and john then one that makes eleven yes eleven but there are some days and the off days never more than nine you know he did not reply being occupied in looking on the ground for his leather belt then he said on getting up mustn't complain i am sound all the same there's more than one at forty-two who are put to the patching maybe old man but that does not give us bread where am i to get it from eh have you got nothing i've got two coppers keep them for a half pint good lord where am i to get it from six days it will never end we owe sixty francs to maigrat who turned me out of doors day before yesterday that won't prevent me from going to see him again but if he goes on refusing and mahid continued in her melancholy voice without moving her head only closing her eyes now and then beneath the dim light of the candle she said the cupboard was empty the little ones asking for bread and butter even the coffee was done and the water caused colic and the long days passed in deceiving hunger with boiled cabbage leaves 
little by little she had been obliged to raise her voice for estelle's screams drowned her words these cries became unbearable maheu seemed all at once to hear them and in a fury snatched the little one up from the cradle and threw it on the mother's bed stammering with rage here take her i'll do it for her damn the child it wants for nothing it sucks and it complains louder than all the rest estelle began in fact to suck hidden beneath the clothes and soothed by the warmth of the bed her cries subsided into the greedy little sound of her lips haven't the Piolain people told you to go and see them asked the father after a period of silence the mother bit her lip with an air of discouraged doubt yes they met me they were carrying clothes for poor children yes i'll take lenore and henri to them this morning if they only give me a few pence there was silence again maheu was ready he remained a moment motionless then added in his hollow voice what is it that you want let things be and see about the soup it's no good talking better be at work down below true enough replied maheu blow out the candle i don't need to see the colour of my thoughts he blew out the candle zacharie and jeanlin were already going down he followed them and the wooden staircase creaked beneath their heavy feet clad in wool behind them the closet and the room were again dark the children slept even alzire's eyelids were closed but the mother now remained with her eyes open in the darkness while pulling at her breast the pendant breast of an exhausted woman estelle was purring like a kitten down below catherine had at first occupied herself with the fire which was burning in the iron grate flanked by two ovens the company distributed every month to each family eight hectolitres of a hard slaty coal gathered in the passages it burnt slowly and the young girl who piled up the fire every night only had to stir it in the morning adding a few fragments of soft coal carefully picked out then after having placed the kettle on the grate she sat down before the sideboard it was a fairly large room occupying all the ground floor painted in apple green and of flemish cleanliness with its flags well washed and covered with white sand besides the sideboard of varnished deal the furniture consisted of a table and chairs of the same wood stuck on to the walls were some violently coloured prints portraits of the emperor and the empress given by the company of soldiers and of saints speckled with gold contrasting crudely with the simple nudity of the room and there was no other ornament except a box of rose-coloured pasteboard on the sideboard and a clock with its daubed face and loud tick-tack which seemed to fill the emptiness of the place near the staircase door another door led to the cellar in spite of the cleanliness an odour of cooked onion shut up since the night before poisoned the hot heavy air always laden with an acrid flavour of coal catherine in front of the sideboard was reflecting there only remained the end of a loaf cheese in fair abundance but hardly a morsel of butter and she had to provide bread and butter for four at last she decided cut the slices took one and covered it with cheese spread another with butter and stuck them together that was the brick the bread and butter sandwich taken to the pit every morning the four bricks were soon on the table in a row cut with severe justice from the big one for the father down to the little one for jeanlin catherine who appeared absorbed in her household duties must however have been thinking of the stories told by zacharie about the head captain and the perron woman for she half opened the front door and glanced outside the wind was still whistling there were numerous spots of light on the low fronts of the settlement from which arose a vague tremor of awakening already doors were being closed and black files of workers passed into the night it was stupid of her to get cold since the porter at the pit eye was certainly asleep waiting to take his duties at six yet she remained and looked at the house on the other side of the gardens the door opened and her curiosity was aroused but it could only be one of the little perrons lee setting out for the pit 
the hissing sound of steam made her turn she shut the door and hastened back the water was boiling over and putting out the fire there was no more coffee she had to be content to add the water to last night's dregs then she sugared the coffee-pot with brown sugar at that moment her father and two brothers came downstairs faith exclaimed zacharie when he had put his nose into his bowl here's something that won't get into our heads maheu shrugged his shoulders with an air of resignation bah it's hot it's good all the same jeanlin had gathered up the fragments of bread and made a sop of them after having drunk catherine finished by emptying the coffee-pot into the tin jacks all four standing up in the smoky light of the candle swallowed their meals hastily are we at the end said the father one would say we were people of property but a voice came from the staircase of which they had left the door open it was Mahud who was calling out take all the bread i have some vermicelli for the children yes yes replied catherine she had piled up the fire wedging the pot that held the remains of the soup into a corner of the grate so that the grandfather might find it warm when he came in at six each took his sabots from under the sideboard passed the strings of his tin over his shoulder and placed his brick at his back between shirt and jacket and they went out the men first the girl who came last blowing out the candle and turning the key the house became dark again ah we're off together said a man who was closing the door of the next house it was levaque with his son Bebe, an urchin of twelve a great friend of jeanlin's catherine in surprise stifled a laugh in zacharie's ear why but look didn't even wait until the husband had gone now the lights in the settlement were extinguished and the last door banged all again fell asleep the women and the little ones resuming their slumber in the midst of wider beds and from the extinguished village to the roaring voreau a slow filing of shadows took place beneath the squalls the departure of the colliers to their work bending their shoulders and incommoded by their arms crossed on their breasts while the brick behind formed a hump on each back clothed in their thin jackets they shivered with cold but without hastening straggling along the road with the tramp of a flock. End of section two. Section three of Germana by Emile Zola, translated by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part one, chapter three etienne had at last descended from the platform and entered the voreau he spoke to men whom he met asking if there was work to be had but all shook their heads telling him to wait for the captain they left him free to roam through the ill-lighted buildings full of black holes confusing with their complicated stories and rooms after having mounted a dark and half-destroyed staircase he found himself on a shaky footbridge then he crossed the screening shed which was plunged in such profound darkness that he walked with his hands before him for protection suddenly two enormous yellow eyes pierced the darkness in front of him he was beneath the pit frame in the receiving room at the very mouth of the shaft a captain father richon a big man with the face of a good-natured gendarme and with a straight gray moustache was at that moment going towards the receiver's office do they want a hand here for any kind of work asked etienne again richon was about to say no but he changed his mind and replied like the others as he went away wait for monsieur dansart the head captain four lanterns were placed there and the reflectors which threw all the light on to the shaft vividly illuminated the iron rail the levers of the signals and bars the joists of the guides along which slid the two cages the rest of the vast room like the nave of a church was obscure and peopled by great floating shadows only the lamp cabin shone at the far end while in the receiver's office a small lamp looked like a fading star work was about to be resumed 
and on the iron pavement there was a continual thunder trams of coal being wheeled without ceasing while the landers with their long bent backs could be distinguished amid the movement of all these black and noisy things in perpetual agitation for a moment etienne stood motionless deafened and blinded he felt frozen by the currents of air which entered from every side then he moved on a few paces attracted by the winding engine of which he could now see the glistening steel and copper it was twenty-five metres beyond the shaft in a loftier chamber and placed so solidly on its brick foundation that though it worked at full speed with all its four hundred horsepower the movement of its enormous crank emerging and plunging with oily softness imparted no quiver to the walls the engine man standing at his post listened to the ringing of the signals and his eye never moved from the indicator where the shaft was figured with its different levels by a vertical groove traversed by shot hanging to strings which represented the cages and at each departure when the machine was put in motion the drums two immense wheels five metres in radius by means of which the two steel cables were rolled and unrolled turned with such rapidity that they became like great powder look out there cried three landers who were dragging an immense ladder at the end just escaped being crushed his eyes were soon more at home and he watched the cables moving in the air more than thirty metres of steel ribbon which flew up into the pit frame where they passed over pulleys to descend perpendicularly into the shaft where they were attached to the cages an iron frame like the high scaffolding of a belfry supported the pulleys it was like the gliding of a bird noiseless without a jar this rapid flight the continual come and go of a thread of enormous weight capable of lifting twelve thousand kilograms at the rate of ten metres a second attention there for god's sake cried one of the landers pushing the ladder to the other side in order to climb to the left-hand rowel slowly etienne returned to the receiving room this giant flight over his head took away his breath shivering in the currents of air he watched the movement of the cages his ears deafened by the rumblings of the trams near the shaft the signal was working a heavy levered hammer drawn by a cord from below and allowed to strike against a block one blow to stop two to go down three to go up it was unceasing like blows of a club dominating the tumult accompanied by the clear sound of the bell while the lander directing the work increased the noise still more by shouting orders to the engine man through a trumpet the cages in the middle of the clear space appeared and disappeared were filled and emptied without etienne being at all able to understand the complicated proceeding he only understood one thing well the shaft swallowed men by mouthfuls of twenty or thirty and with so easy a gulp that it seemed to feel nothing go down since four o'clock the descent of the workmen had been going on they came to the shed with naked feet and their lamps in their hands waiting in little groups until a sufficient number had arrived without a sound with the soft bound of a nocturnal beast the iron cage arose from the night wedged itself on the bolts with its four decks each containing two trams full of coal landers on different platforms took out the trams and replaced them by others either empty or already laden with trimmed wooden props and it was into the empty trams that the workmen crowded five at a time up to forty when they filled all the compartments an order came from the trumpet a hollow indistinct roar while the signal cord was pulled four times from below ringing meat to give warning of this burden of human flesh then after a slight leap the cage plunged silently falling like a stone only leaving behind it the vibrating flight of a cable is it deep asked etienne of a miner who waited near him with a sleepy air five hundred and fifty-four metres replied the man but there are four levels the first at three hundred and twenty both were silent with their eyes on the returning cable 
etienne said again and if it breaks ah if it breaks the miner ended with a gesture his turn had arrived the cage had reappeared with its easy unfatigued movement he squatted in it with some comrades it plunged down then flew up again in less than four minutes to swallow down another load of men for half an hour the shaft went on devouring in this fashion with more or less greedy gulps according to the depth of the level to which the men went down but without stopping always hungry with its giant intestines capable of digesting a nation it went on filling and still filling and the darkness remained dead the cage mounted from the void with the same voracious silence etienne was at last seized again by the same depression which he had experienced on the pit bank what was the good of persisting this head captain would send him off like the others a vague fear suddenly decided him he went away only stopping before the building of the engine-room the wide open door showed seven boilers with two furnaces in the midst of the white steam and the whistling of the escapes a stoker was occupied in piling up one of the furnaces the heat of which could be felt as far as the threshold and the young man was approaching glad of the warmth when he met a new band of colliers who had just arrived at the pit it was the Mehu and levaque said when he saw catherine at the head with her gentle boyish air a superstitious idea caused him to risk another question i say there mate do you want a hand here for any kind of work she looked at him surprised rather frightened at this sudden voice coming out of the shadow but Mehu, behind her had heard and replied talking with etienne for a moment no no one was wanted this poor devil of a man who had lost his way here interested him when he left him he said to the others eh one might easily be like that mustn't complain every one hasn't the chance to work himself to death the band entered and went straight to the shed a vast hall roughly boarded and surrounded by cupboards shut by padlocks in the centre an iron fireplace a sort of closed stove without a door glowed red and was so stuffed with burning coal that fragments flew out and rolled on to the trodden soil the hall was only lighted by this stove from which sanguine reflections danced along the greasy woodwork up to the ceiling stained with black dust as the mehus went into the heat there was a sound of laughter some thirty workmen were standing upright with their backs to the fire roasting themselves with an air of enjoyment before going down they all came here to get a little warmth in their skins so that they could face the dampness of the pit but this morning there was much in amusement they were joking moquette a putter girl of eighteen whose enormous breasts and flanks were bursting through her old jacket and breeches she lived at Requillac with her father old moque a groom and moquette her brother a lander but their hours of work were not the same she went to the pit by herself and in the middle of the wheat-fields in summer or against a wall in winter she took her pleasure with her lover of the week all in the mine had their turn it was a perpetual round of comrades without further consequences one day when reproached about a marchand nail-maker she was furiously angry exclaiming that she respected herself far too much that she would cut her arm off if any one could boast that he had seen her with any one but a collier it isn't that big cheval now said a miner grinning did that little fellow have you he must have needed a ladder i saw you behind requillard a token that he got up on a milestone well replied moquet in a good humour what's that to do with you you were not asked to push and this gross good-natured joke increased the laughter of the men who expanded their shoulders half cooked by the stove while she herself shaken with laughter was displaying in the midst of them the indecency of her costume embarrassingly comical with her masses of flesh exaggerated almost to disease but the gaiety ceased moquette told Mahieu that florence big florence 
would never come again she had been found the night before stiff in her bed some said it was her heart others that it was a pint of gin she had drunk too quickly and maheu was in despair another piece of ill luck one of the best of his putters gone without any chance of replacing her at once he was working in a set there were four pikemen associated in his cutting himself zacharie levaque and chaval if they had catherine alone to wheel the work would suffer suddenly he called out i have it there was that man looking for work at that moment dansart passed before the shed maheu told him the story and asked for his authority to engage the man he emphasized the desire of the company to substitute men for women as at Anzin. the head captain smiled at first for the scheme of excluding women from the pit was not usually well received by the miners who were troubled about placing their daughters and not much affected by questions of morality and health but after some hesitation he gave his permission reserving its ratification for m Negrel, the engineer all very well exclaimed zacharie the man must be away by this time no said catherine i saw him stop at the boilers after him then lazy cried maheu the young girl ran forward while a crowd of miners proceeded to the shaft yielding the fire to others jeanlin without waiting for his father went also to take his lamp together with bevere a big stupid boy and lady a small child of ten bouquet who was in front of them called out in the black passage they were dirty brats and threatened to box their ears if they pinched her etienne was in fact in the boiler building talking with a stoker who was charging the furnaces with coal he felt very cold at the thought of the night into which he must return but he was deciding to set out when he felt a hand placed on his shoulder come said catherine there's something for you at first he could not understand then he felt a spasm of joy and vigorously squeezed the young girl's hands thanks mate ah you're a good chap you are she began to laugh looking at him in the red light of the furnaces which lit them up it amused her that he should take her for a boy still slender with her knot of hair hidden beneath the cap he also was laughing with satisfaction and they remained for a moment both laughing in each other's faces with radiant cheeks Maheu, squatting down before his box in the shed was taking off his sabots and his coarse woolen stockings when at the end arrived everything was settled in three or four words thirty sous a day hard work but work that he would easily learn the pikeman advised him to keep his shoes and lent him an old cap a leather hat for the protection of his skull a precaution which the father and his children disdained the tools were taken out of the chest where also was found laurence's shovel then when maheu had shut up their sabots their stockings as well as etienne's bundle he suddenly became impatient what is that lazy cheval up to another girl given a tumble on a pile of stones we are half an hour late to-day zacharie and levaque were quietly roasting their shoulders the former said at last is it cheval you're waiting for he came before us and went down at once what you knew that and said nothing come come look sharp catherine who was warming her hands had to follow the band etienne allowed her to pass and went behind her again he journeyed through a maze of staircases and obscure corridors in which their naked feet produced the soft sound of old slippers but the lamp cabin was glittering a glass house full of hooks in rows holding hundreds of davy lamps examined and washed the night before and lighted like candles in a mortuary chapel at the barrier each workman took his own stamped with his number then he examined it and shut it himself while the marker seated at a table inscribed on the registers the hour of descent maheu had to intervene to obtain a lamp for his new putter and there was still another precaution the workers defiled before an examiner who assured himself that all the lamps were properly closed golly it's not warm here murmured catherine shivering 
etienne contented himself with nodding his head he was in front of the shaft in the midst of a vast hall swept by currents of air he certainly considered himself brave but he felt a disagreeable emotion at his chest amid this thunder of trams the hollow blows of the signals the stifled howling of the trumpet the continual flight of those cables unrolled and rolled at full speed by the drums of the engine the cages rose and sank with the gliding movement of a nocturnal beast always engulfing men whom the throat of the hole seemed to drink it was his turn now he felt very cold and preserved a nervous silence which made zacharie and levaque grin for both of them disapproved of the hiring of this unknown man especially levaque who was offended that he had not been consulted so catherine was glad to hear her father explain things to the young man look above the cage there is a parachute with iron grapnels to catch into the guides in case of breakage does it work oh not always yes the shaft is divided into three compartments closed by planking from top to bottom in the middle the cages on the left the passage for the ladders but he interrupted himself to grumble though taking care not to raise his voice much what are we stuck here for blast it what right have they to freeze us in this way the captain Richon, who was going down himself with his naked lamp fixed by a nail into the leather of his cap heard him careful look out for ears he murmured paternally as an old miner with affectionate feeling for comrades workmen must do what they can hold on here we are get in with your fellows the cage provided with iron bands and a small meshed lattice-work was in fact awaiting them on the bars Mehieu, zacharie and catherine slid into a tram below and as all five had to enter etienne in his turn went in but the good places were taken he had to squeeze himself near the young girl whose elbow pressed into his belly his lamp embarrassed him they advised him to fasten it to the buttonhole of his jacket not hearing he awkwardly kept it in his hand the embarkation continued above and below a confused packing of cattle they did not however set out what then was happening it seemed to him that his impatience lasted for many minutes at last he felt a shock and the light grew dim everything around him seemed to fly while he experienced the dizzy anxiety of a fall contracting his bowels this lasted as long as he could see light through the two reception stories in the midst of the whirling by of the scaffolding then having fallen into the blackness of the pit he became stunned no longer having any clear perception of his sensations now we are off said Mayhew quietly they were all at their ease he asked himself at times if he was going up or down now and then when the cage went straight without touching the guides there seemed to be no motion but rough shocks were afterwards produced a sort of dancing amid the joists which made him fear a catastrophe for the rest he could not distinguish the walls of the shaft behind the lattice-work to which he pressed his face the lamps feebly lighted the mass of bodies at his feet only the captain's naked light in the neighbouring tram shone like a lighthouse this is four metres in diameter continued maheu to instruct him the tubbing wants doing over again for the water comes in everywhere stop we are reaching the bottom do you hear etienne was in fact now asking himself the meaning of this noise of falling rain a few large drops had at first sounded on the roof of the cage like the beginning of a shower and now the rain increased streaming down becoming at last a deluge the roof must be full of holes for a thread of water was flowing on to his shoulder and wetting him to the skin the cold became icy and they were buried in black humidity when they passed through a sudden flash of light the vision of a cavern in which men were moving but already they had fallen back into darkness maheu said that is the first main level we are at three hundred and twenty metres see the speed raising his lamp he lighted up a joist of the guides which fled by like a rail beneath a train going at full speed and beyond as before nothing could be seen 
they passed three other levels in flashes of light the deafening rain continued to strike through the darkness how deep it is murmured etienne this fall seemed to last for hours he was suffering for the cramped position he had taken not daring to move and especially tortured by catherine's elbow she did not speak a word he only felt her against him and it warmed him when the cage at last stopped at the bottom at five hundred and fifty four metres he was astonished to learn that the descent had lasted exactly one minute but the noise of the bolts fixing themselves the sensation of solidity beneath suddenly cheered him and he was joking when he said to catherine what have you got under your skin to be so warm i've got your elbow in my belly sure enough then she also burst out laughing stupid of him still to take her for a boy were his eyes out it's in your eye that you got my elbow she replied in the midst of a storm of laughter which the astonished young man could not account for the cage voided its burden of workers who crossed the pit-eye hall a chamber cut in the rock vaulted with masonry and lighted up by three large lamps over the iron flooring the porters were violently rolling laden trams a cavernous odour exhaled from the walls a freshness of saltpetre in which mingled hot breaths from the neighbouring stable the openings of four galleries yawned here this way said maheu to etienne you're not there yet it is still two kilometres the workmen separated and were lost in groups in the depths of these black holes some fifteen went off into that on the left and at the end walked last behind maheu who was preceded by catherine zacharie and levaque it was a large gallery for wagons through a bed of solid rock which had only needed walling here and there in single file they still went on without a word by the tiny flame of the lamps the young man stumbled at every step and entangled his feet in the rails for a moment a hollow sound disturbed him the sound of a distant storm the violence of which seemed to increase and to come from the bowels of the earth was it the thunder of a landslip bringing on to their heads the enormous mass which separated them from the light a gleam pierced the night he felt the rock tremble and when he had placed himself close to the wall like his comrades he saw a large white horse close to his face harnessed to a train of wagons on the first and holding the reins was seated Bever, while jeanlin with his hands leaning on the edge of the last was running barefooted behind they again began their walk farther on they reached crossways where two new galleries opened and the band divided again the workers gradually entering all the stalls of the mine now the wagon gallery was constructed of wood props of timber supported the roof and made for the crumbly rock a screen of scaffolding behind which one could see the plates of schist glimmering with mica and coarse masses of dull rough sandstone trains of tubs full or empty continually passed crossing each other with their thunder borne into the shadow by vague beasts trotting by like phantoms on the double way of a shunting line a long black serpent slept a train at standstill with a snorting horse whose crupper looked like a block fallen from the roof doors for ventilation were slowly opening and shutting and as they advanced the gallery became more narrow and lower and the roof irregular forcing them to bend their backs constantly etienne struck his head hard without his leather cap he would have broken his skull however he attentively followed the slightest gestures of maheu whose sombre profile was seen against the glimmer of the lamps none of the workmen knocked themselves they evidently knew each boss each knot of wood or swelling in the rock the young man also suffered from the slippery soil which became damper and damper at times he went through actual puddles only revealed by the muddy splash of his feet but what especially astonished him were the sudden changes of temperature at the bottom of the shaft it was very chilly and in the wagon gallery through which all the air of the mine passed an icy breeze was blowing with the violence of a tempest between the narrow walls afterwards 
as they penetrated more deeply along other passages which only received a meagre share of air the wind fell and the heat increased a suffocating heat as heavy as lead maheu had not again opened his mouth he turned down another gallery to the right simply saying to etienne without looking round the guillaume scene it was the scene which contained their cutting at the first step etienne hurt his head and elbows the sloping roof descended so low that for twenty or thirty metres at a time he had to walk bent double the water came up to his ankles after two hundred metres of this he saw levaque zacharie and catherine disappear as though they had flown through a narrow fissure which was open in front of him we must climb said maheu fasten your lamp to a buttonhole and hang on to the wood he himself disappeared and etienne had to follow him this chimney passage left in the seam was reserved for miners and led to all the secondary passages it was about the thickness of the coal bed hardly sixty centimetres fortunately the young man was thin for as he was still awkward he hoisted himself up with a useless expense of muscle flattening his shoulders and hips advancing by the strength of his wrists clinging to the planks fifteen metres higher they came on the first secondary passage but they had to continue as the cutting of maheu and his mates was in the sixth passage in hell as they said every fifteen metres the passages were placed over each other in never-ending succession through this cleft which scraped back and chest etienne groaned as if the weight of the rocks had pounded his limbs with torn hands and bruised legs he also suffered from lack of air so that he seemed to feel the blood bursting through his skin he vaguely saw in one passage two squatting beasts a big one and a little one pushing trams they were lighty and moquette already at work and he had still to climb the height of two cuttings he was blinded by sweat and he despaired of catching up the others whose agile limbs he heard brushing against the rock with a long gliding movement cheer up here we are said catherine's voice he had in fact arrived and another voice cried from the bottom of the cutting well is this the way to treat people i have two kilometres to walk from montsou and i am here first it was cheval a tall lean bony fellow of twenty-five with strongly marked features who was in a bad humour at having to wait when he saw etienne he asked with contemptuous surprise what's that and when maheu had told him the story he added between his teeth these men are eating the bread of girls the two men exchanged a look lighted up by one of those instinctive hatreds which suddenly flame up etienne had felt the insult without yet understanding it there was silence and they got to work at last all the seams were gradually filled and the cuttings were in movement at every level and at the end of every passage the devouring shaft had swallowed its daily ration of men nearly seven hundred hands who were now at work in this giant ant hill everywhere making holes in the earth drilling it like an old worm eaten piece of wood and in the middle of the heavy silence and crushing weight of the strata one could hear by placing one's ear to the rock the movement of these human insects at work from the flight of the cable which moved the cage up and down to the biting of the tools cutting out the coal at the end of the stalls at the end on turning round found himself again pressed close to catherine but this time he caught a glimpse of the developing curves of her breast he suddenly understood the warmth which had penetrated him you are a girl then he exclaimed stupefied she replied in her cheerful way without blushing of course you've taken your time to find it out End of section three section four of germinal by emile zola translated by havelock ellis this LibriVox recording is in the public domain reading by matt perard part one chapter four the four pikemen had spread themselves one above the other over the whole face of the cutting 
separated by planks hooked on to retain the fallen coal they each occupied about four metres of the seam and this seam was so thin scarcely more than fifty centimetres thick at this spot that they seemed to be flattened between the roof and the wall dragging themselves along by their knees and elbows and unable to turn without crushing their shoulders in order to attack the coal they had to lie on their sides with their necks twisted and arms raised brandishing in a sloping direction their short-handled picks below there was first zachary levaque and chaval were on the stages above and at the very top was Mahil. each worked at the lady bed which he dug out with blows of the pick then he made two vertical cuttings in the bed and attached the block by burying an iron wedge in its upper part the coal was rich the block broke and rolled in fragments along their bellies and thighs when these fragments retained by the plank had collected round them the pikemen disappeared buried in the narrow cleft maheu suffered most at the top the temperature rose to thirty-five degrees and the air was stagnant so that in the long run it became lethal in order to see he had been obliged to fix his lamp to a nail near his head and this lamp close to his skull still further heated his blood but his torment was especially aggravated by the moisture the rock above him a few centimetres from his face streamed with water which fell in large continuous rapid drops with a sort of obstinate rhythm always at the same spot it was vain for him to twist his head or bend back his neck they fell on his face dropping unceasingly in a quarter of an hour he was soaked and at the same time covered with sweat smoking as with the hot steam of a laundry this morning a drop beating upon his eye made him swear he would not leave his picking he dealt great strokes which shook him violently between the two rocks like a fly caught between two leaves of a book and in danger of being completely flattened not a word was exchanged they all hammered one only heard these irregular blows which seemed veiled and remote the sounds had a sonorous hoarseness without any echo in the dead air and it seemed that the darkness was an unknown blackness thickened by the floating coal dust made heavy by the gas which weighed on the eyes the wicks of the lamps beneath their caps of metallic tissue only showed as reddish points one could distinguish nothing the cutting opened out above like a large chimney flat and oblique in which the soot of ten years had amassed a, a profound night spectral figures were moving in it the gleams of light enabled one to catch a glimpse of a rounded hip a knotty arm a vigorous head besmeared as if for a crime sometimes blocks of coal shone suddenly as they became detached illuminated by a crystalline reflection then everything fell back into darkness pickaxes struck great hollow blows one only heard panting chests the grunting of discomfort and weariness beneath the weight of the air and the rain of the springs zachary with arms weakened by a spree of the night before soon left his work on the pretence that more timbering was necessary this allowed him to forget himself in quiet whistling his eyes vaguely resting in the shade behind the pikemen nearly three metres of the seam were clear and they had not yet taken the precaution of supporting the rock having grown careless of danger and miserly of their time here you swell cried the young man to etienne hand up some wood etienne who was learning from catherine how to manage his shovel had to raise the wood in the cutting a small supply had remained over from yesterday it was usually sent down every morning ready cut to fit the bed hurry up there damn it shouted zachary seeing the new putter hoist himself up awkwardly in the midst of the coal his arms embarrassed by four pieces of oak he made a hole in the roof with his pickaxe and then another in the wall and wedged in the two ends of the wood which thus supported the rock in the afternoon the workers in the earth cutting took the rubbish left at the bottom of the gallery by the pikemen and cleared out the exhausted section of the seam in which they destroyed the wood being only careful about the lower and upper roads for the haulage maheu ceased to groan 
at last he had detached his block and he wiped his streaming face on his sleeve he was worried about what zacharie was doing behind him let it be he said we will see after breakfast better go on hewing if we want to make up our share of trams it's because it's sinking replied the young man look there's a crack it may slip but the father shrugged his shoulders ah nonsense slip and if it did it would not be the first time they would get out of it all right he grew angry at last and sent his son to the front of the cutting all of them however were now stretching themselves levaque resting on his back was swearing as he examined his left thumb which had been grazed by the fall of a piece of sandstone chaval had taken off his shirt in a fury and was working with bare chest and back for the sake of coolness they were already black with coal soaked in a fine dust diluted with sweat which ran down in streams and pools maheu first began again to hammer lower down with his head level with the rock now the drop struck his forehead so obstinately that he seemed to feel it piercing a hole in the bone of his skull you mustn't mind explained catherine to etienne they are always howling and like a good-natured girl she went on with her lesson every laden tram arrived at the top in the same condition as it left the cutting marked with a special metal token so that the receiver might put it to the reckoning of the stall it was necessary therefore to be very careful to fill it and only to take clean coal otherwise it was refused at the receiving office the young man whose eyes were now becoming accustomed to the darkness looked at her still white with her chlorotic complexion and he could not have told her age he thought she must be twelve she seemed to him so slight however he felt she must be older with her boyish freedom a simple audacity which confused him a little she did not please him he thought her too roguish with her pale pyrrha head framed at the temples by the cap but what astonished him was the strength of this child a nervous strength which was blended with a good deal of skill she filled her tram faster than he could with quick small regular strokes of the shovel she afterwards pushed it to the inclined way with a single slow push without a hitch easily passing under the low rocks he tore himself to pieces got off the rails and was reduced to despair it was certainly not a convenient road it was sixty metres from the cutting to the upbrow and the passage which the miners in the earth cutting had not yet enlarged was a mere tube with a very irregular roof swollen by innumerable bosses at certain spots the laden tram could only just pass the putter had to flatten himself to push on his knees in order not to break his head and besides this the wood was already bending and yielding one could see it broken in the middle in long pale rents like an overweak crutch one had to be careful not to graze oneself in these fractures and beneath the slow crushing which caused the splitting of billets of oak as large as the thigh one had to glide almost on one's belly with a secret fear of suddenly hearing one's back break again said catherine laughing etienne's tram had gone off the rails at the most difficult spot he could not roll straight on these rails which sank in the damp earth and he swore became angry and fought furiously with the wheels which he could not get back into place in spite of exaggerated efforts wait a bit said the young girl if you get angry it will never go skilfully she had glided down and thrust her buttocks beneath the tram and by putting the weight on her loins she raised it and replaced it the weight was seven hundred kilograms surprised and ashamed he stammered excuses she was obliged to show him how to straddle his legs and brace his feet against the planking on both sides of the gallery in order to give himself a more solid fulcrum the body had to be bent the arms made stiff so as to push with all the muscles of the shoulders and hips during the journey he followed her and watched her proceed with tense back her fists so low that she seemed trotting on all fours like one of those dwarf beasts that perform at circuses she sweated panted her joints cracked but without a complaint 
with the indifference of custom as if it were the common wretchedness of all to live thus bent double but he could not succeed in doing as much his shoes troubled him his body seemed broken by walking in this way with lowered head at the end of a few minutes the position became a torture an intolerable anguish so painful that he got on his knees for a moment to straighten himself and breathe then at the upbrow there was more labor she taught him to fill his tram quickly at the top and bottom of this inclined plane which served all the cuttings from one level to the other there was a trammer the brakesman above the receiver below these scamps of twelve to fifteen years shouted abominable words to each other and to warn them it was necessary to yell still more violently then as soon as there was an empty tram to send back the receiver gave the signal and the putter embarked her full tram the weight of which made the other ascend when the brakesman loosened his brake below in the bottom gallery were formed the trains which the horses drew to the shaft here you confounded rascals cried catherine in the inclined way which was wood-lined about a hundred metres long and resounded like a gigantic trumpet the trammers must have been resting for neither of them replied on all the levels haulage had stopped a shrill girl's voice said at last one of them must be on moquette sure enough there was a roar of laughter and the putters of the whole scene held their sides who is that asked etienne of catherine the latter named little lady a scamp who knew more than she ought and who pushed her tram as stoutly as a woman in spite of her doll's arms as to moquette she was quite capable of being with both the trammers at once but the voice of the receiver arose shouting out to load doubtless a captain was passing beneath haulage began again on the nine levels and one only heard the regular calls of the trammers and the snorting of the putters arriving at the upbrow and steaming like overladen mares it was the element of bestiality which breathed in the pit the sudden desire of the male when a miner met one of these girls on all fours with her flanks in the air and her hips bursting through her boy's breeches and on each journey etienne found again at the bottom the stuffiness of the cutting the hollow and broken cadence of the axes the deep painful sighs of the pikemen persisting in their work all four were naked mixed up with the coal soaked with black mud up to the cap at one moment it had been necessary to free maheu who was gasping and to remove the planks so that the coal could fall into the passage zacharie and levaque became enraged with the seam which was now hard they said and which would make the condition of their account disastrous chaval turned lying for a moment on his back abusing etienne whose presence decidedly exasperated him a sort of worm hasn't the strength of a girl are you going to fill your tub it's to spare your arms eh damned if i don't keep back the ten sous if you get us one refused the young man avoided replying too happy at present to have found this convict's labor and accepting the brutal rule of the worker by master worker but he could no longer walk his feet were bleeding his limbs torn by horrible cramps his body confined in an iron girdle fortunately it was ten o'clock and the stall decided to have breakfast maheude had a watch but he did not even look at it at the bottom of this starless night he was never five minutes out all put on their shirts and jackets then descending from the cutting they squatted down their elbows to their sides their buttocks on their heels in that posture so habitual with miners that they keep it even when out of the mine without feeling the need of a stone or a beam to sit on and each having taken out his brick bit seriously at the thick slice uttering occasional words on the morning's work catherine who remained standing at last joined etienne who had stretched himself out farther along across the rails with his back against the planking there was a place there almost dry you don't eat she said to him with her mouth full and her brick in her hand then she remembered that this youth wandering about at night without a sou perhaps had not a bit of bread will you share with me 
and as he refused declaring that he was not hungry while his voice trembled with the gnawing in his stomach she went on cheerfully ah if you are fastidious but here i've only bitten on that side i will give you this she had already broken the bread and butter into two pieces the young man taking his half restrained himself from devouring it all at once and placed his arms on his thighs so that she should not see how he trembled with her quiet air of good comradeship she lay beside him at full length on her stomach with her chin in one hand slowly eating with the other their lamps placed between them lit up their faces catherine looked at him a moment in silence she must have found him handsome with his delicate face and black moustache she vaguely smiled with pleasure then you are an engine driver and they sent you away from your railway why because i struck my chief she remained stupefied overwhelmed with her hereditary ideas of subordination and passive obedience i ought to say that i had been drinking he went on and when i drink i get mad i could devour myself and i could devour other people yes i can't swallow two small glasses without wanting to kill someone then i am ill for two days you mustn't drink she said seriously ah don't be afraid i know myself and he shook his head he hated brandy with the hatred of the last child of a race of drunkards who suffered in his flesh from all those ancestors soaked and driven mad by alcohol to such a point that the least drop had become poison to him it is because of mother that i didn't like being turned into the street he said after having swallowed a mouthful mother is not happy and i used to send her a five-franc piece now and then where is she then your mother at paris a laundress rue de la Gaupe d'Or. there was silence when he thought of these things a tremor dimmed his dark eyes the sudden anguish of the injury he brooded over in his fine youthful strength for a moment he remained with his looks buried in the darkness of the mine and at that depth beneath the weight and suffocation of the earth he saw his childhood again his mother still beautiful and strong forsaken by his father then taken up again after having married another man living with the two men who ruined her rolling with them in the gutter in drink and ordure it was down there he recalled the street the details came back to him the dirty linen in the middle of the shop the drunken carousals that made the house stink and the jaw-breaking blows now he began again in a slow voice i haven't even thirty sous to make her presence with she will die of misery sure enough he shrugged his shoulders with despair and again bit at his bread and butter will you drink asked catherine uncorking her tin oh it's coffee it won't hurt you one gets dry when one eats like that but he refused it was quite enough to have taken half her bread however she insisted good-naturedly and said at last well i will drink before you since you are so polite only you can't refuse now it would be rude she held out her tin to him she had got on to her knees and he saw her quite close to him lit up by the two lamps why had he found her ugly now that she was black her face powdered with fine charcoal she seemed to him singularly charming in this face surrounded by shadow the teeth and the broad mouth shone with whiteness while the eyes looked large and gleamed with a greenish reflection like a cat's eyes a lock of red hair which had escaped from her cap tickled her ear and made her laugh she no longer seemed so young she might be quite fourteen to please you he said drinking and giving her back the tin she swallowed a second mouthful and forced him to take one too wishing to share she said and that little tin that went from one mouth to the other amused them he suddenly asked himself if he should not take her in his arms and kiss her lips she had large lips of a pale rose colour made vivid by the coal which tormented him with increasing desire but he did not dare intimidated before her only having known girls on the streets of lille of the lowest order and not realizing how one ought to behave with a work-girl still living with her family you must be about fourteen then he asked 
after having gone back to his bread she was astonished almost angry what fourteen but i am fifteen it's true i'm not big girls don't grow quick with us he went on questioning her and she told everything without boldness or shame for the rest she was not ignorant concerning man and woman although he felt that her body was virginal with the virginity of a child delayed in her sexual maturity by the environment of bad air and weariness in which she lived when he spoke of moquette in order to embarrass her she told some horrible stories in a quiet voice with much amusement ah she did some fine things and as he asked if she herself had no lovers she replied jokingly that she did not wish to vex her mother but that it must happen some day her shoulders were bent she shivered a little from the coldness of her garments soaked in sweat with a gentle resigned air ready to submit to things and men people can find lovers when they all live together can't they sure enough and then it doesn't hurt any one one doesn't tell the priest oh the priest i don't care for him but there is the black man what do you mean the black man the old miner who comes back into the pit and wrings naughty girls necks he looked at her afraid that she was making fun of him you believe in those stupid things then you don't know anything yes i do i can read and write that is useful among us in father and mother's time they learnt nothing she was certainly very charming when she had finished her bread and butter he would take her and kiss her on her large rosy lips it was the resolution of timidity a thought of violence which choked his voice these boys clothes this jacket and these breeches on the girl's flesh excited and troubled him he had swallowed his last mouthful he drank from the tin and gave it back to her to empty now the moment for action had come and he cast a restless glance at the miners farther on but a shadow blocked the gallery for a moment chaval stood and looked at them from afar he came forward having assured himself that maheu could not see him and as catherine was seated on the earth he seized her by the shoulders drew her head back and tranquilly crushed her mouth beneath a brutal kiss affecting not to notice etienne there was in that kiss an act of possession a sort of jealous resolution however the young girl was offended let me go do you hear he kept hold of her head and looked into her eyes his moustache and small red beard flamed in his black face with its large eagle nose he let her go at last and went away without speaking a word a shudder had frozen etienne it was stupid to have waited he could certainly not kiss her now for she would perhaps think that he wished to behave like the other in his wounded vanity he experienced real despair why did you lie he said in a low voice he's your lover but no i swear she cried there is not that between us sometimes he likes a joke he doesn't even belong here it's six months since he came from the pas de calais both rose work was about to be resumed when she saw him so cold she seemed annoyed doubtless she found him handsomer than the other she would have preferred him perhaps the idea of some amiable consoling relationship disturbed her and when the young man saw with surprise that his lamp was burning blue with a large pale ring she tried at least to amuse him come i will show you something she said in a friendly way when she had led him to the bottom of the cutting she pointed out to him a crevice in the coal a slight bubbling escaped from it a little noise like the warbling of a bird put your hand there you'll feel the wind it's fire damp he was surprised was that all was that the terrible thing which blew everything up she laughed she said there was a good deal of it to-day to make the flame of the lamp so blue now if you've done chattering lazy louts cried maheu's rough voice catherine and etienne hastened to fill their trams and push them to the upbrow with stiffened back crawling beneath the bossy roof of the passage even after the second journey the sweat ran off them and their joints began to crack the pikemen had resumed work in the cutting the men often shortened their breakfast to avoid getting cold and their bricks eaten in this way far from the sun with silent voracity 
loaded their stomachs with lead stretched on their sides they hammered more loudly with the one fixed idea of filling a large number of trams every thought disappeared in this rage for gain which was so hard to earn they no longer felt the water which streamed on them and swelled their limbs the cramps of forced attitudes the suffocation of the darkness in which they grew pale like plants put in a cellar yet as the day advanced the air became more poisoned and heated with the smoke of the lamps with the pestilence of their breaths with the asphyxia of the fire damp blinding to the eyes like spiders webs which only the aeration of the night could sweep away at the bottom of their molehill beneath the weight of the earth with no more breath in their inflamed lungs they went on hammering End of section four.